Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining me this evening. I'm Melanie Wallace Creamer. I'm the greenhouse manager here at Mount Vernon, and you are getting a behind the scenes look at one of our production greenhouses here. In addition to joining me for a container gardening workshop. We are offering this workshop free. However, if you are able to, we are suggesting a donation of $20 because during these unprecedented times, we are asking for donations to support our staff and 100% of the proceeds are going to support our staff. So a little bit about the Mount Vernon greenhouses. So here we produce an average of 20,000 plants a year for use on the estate, be it in our gardens, which are where we produce our historic plant material. And we also have areas that we refer to as our landscape areas, where we have a little bit more play to use some non-historic plants as well. And then we also produce plants for retail sales as well. Now it is that time of year, the end of April, where a lot of you are thinking about planting. And many of you are used to our Mount Vernon Historic Plant and Garden sales starting up very soon. Unfortunately, due to the circumstances this year, we are not able to have our normal sale. However, the good news is that we are going to have an online sale and then offer pickup of the plants here at Mount Vernon. So tomorrow morning, an email will be sent out, and also online, you can go, there's a web page for the Mount Vernon plant sale, and then it will link you to our shops, where you can browse through our plant material, select what you'd like to purchase, pay for it, and then we will contact you with a date to come to Mount Vernon and pick up your plants. Our first pickup date will be on May 1st. There are also a few other ways you can support Mount Vernon at this time. In addition to buying plant material online, we also have an amazing array of products that our gift shop offers for sale. And if you're not able to buy plants, there's also seeds for sale online as well. All right, so now moving on to our subject for today, container gardening. So this is a subject that is near and dear to my heart and one of my favorite things to do. Not only in home, but here at Mount Vernon, because I get the privilege of making the majority of the pretty containers that we use at different events on the estate. So the first thing you have to think about when you wanna start a container garden is what kind of plants am I gonna grow? Do you wanna grow vegetables? Do you wanna grow herbs, flowers, or a combination? Because that's gonna help you make your next decision. So what size container do I need and what type of container do I want? So right here in front of me, I have some different options. So this is basically kind of like a plasticky kind of resin type material. To my right is one of my favorite kind of containers to use because they're so pretty and they add an extra element of color. The only challenge with these, the ceramic containers is that you need to make sure you bring them inside in the winter because if they freeze outside um, in cold temperatures, they will crack. And the other disadvantage is that they're quite heavy. So if you have a hard time lifting things, you may want to consider more of a plastic type material. Or I will say there are a lot of very handy little plant caddies with wheels on them now. So you could always get a plant caddy with wheels to help you be able to move your containers around more easily. Uh, this is just one of those good old basic, you know, plastic terracotta looking containers. And then I have some other ceramics um, containers. And once again, like I said, I mean, I like to use a container that has a little color. It just adds a little extra pop to your container garden. When you're growing vegetables, usually the rule of thumb is the bigger the container, the better. Now, that's not always the case. Um, if you only have small containers, you could think about growing something like simple, like some greens, some lettuce, or some spinach could be easily done in a small container. Some other things to think about. So what's your living situation? Do you have a huge deck and you have endless amount of space that you can cover your whole deck with containers? Or do you have a tiny balcony or patio and you only have a limited amount of space? These are some things to think about when you're planning your container garden. Oh, and another note, so if you live on a tall building, especially around here in the DC area, a real high rise building out with the balcony, another thing you're gonna have to think about is wind. So not everyone has to take that into effect, uh, take that into account, but you know, if you're high up on the side of an apartment building, it can get really windy for your plants. So just think about that 
you know, maybe there's a way you can use the building to shelter the plant material to keep it from getting damaged by the wind. Or make a grouping of plant material. Use some larger plants to kind of screen out your smaller plants to protect them. <clears throat> All right, so some other things to think about after you go ahead and decide on what kind of containers you want to use is now what are you going to fill it with? I generally recommend that people go and purchase a potting mix, and it should say a potting mix. You don't want to go out and get just like the garden soil because that's usually really heavy material. Um, and once again, it goes back to you got to think about the containers if you're going to move them around, um, because putting a really heavy growing medium into your container makes it even heavier. And something else to think about if you live on a balcony, what's the weight load of all these containers going to be? You don't want to overload your balcony with really heavy containers and then really heavy potting mix. That could end in bad results, and I don't want that to happen to anyone. Um, so go get a potting mix. Now, generally, most potting mixes are going to be peat moss based. Um, so you can see kind of this one I'm holding up here. There's peat moss in here. The white material is called perlite. And then we also get a mix that has some pine bark in it as well. If you're, if you're interested, um, there are also a lot of recipes online for making your own potting mix. So that's something that you can do too. But make sure that, you know, you have to think about once again, like I said, how heavy your mix is going to be, how much time you have on your hands, and also the kind of plants you're growing. I do recommend if you go and get just a general potting mix that if you're going to grow tomatoes, for example, tomatoes like a lot of food. They're heavy feeders, so I recommend mixing in like some compost or something else um, to give them some more food. Now, I did do an experiment this spring. Because I'll say, I, I've had a little bit more time on my hands this spring than I normally have. And I went to the garden center and I bought everything to make my own mix from scratch for my containers this year. I came home with the back of my vehicle <laughs> filled with bags of various mixes, um, which my husband took one look at and asked me how much it costs. Love you, baby. Um, anyway. <laughs> but it was something I wanted to try because... I, I, regardless of the circumstances this year or situations of thing going on, I wanted to do a lot more containers than we normally do because I have a daughter who's two years old and I really want, it, want to share with her the joy of gardening as my family did with me. So I actually asked my parents what they normally use because they do a lot of, I don't know if any of you heard about the, the square foot gardening. Um, that's a big, a big trend in gardening for raised beds. So I took the recipe that they had given me off one of their square, square foot gardening books, and that's what I went to the garden center with. So I should have some really happy plants this year. I'm mixing together peat moss, a course vermiculite, and then I bought composted cow manure, mushroom compost, leaf compost, and to top it off, lobster compost from Maine. And that is all mixed together. So obviously I can't let you know how that's going today, but hopefully by the end of the season, Oh, like I said, I'll have some really happy and productive vegetable plants. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and we're going to do some planting demonstrations. Um, and as we do it, feel free to send in your questions if there's things that you want to know. Oh, and I wanted to share. So if some of you don't like it when you get the, when you fill the pot and the dirt falls out onto your uh, balcony or patio, you can go ahead and you can cut a piece of landscape fabric and then you can put it in the very bottom of your pot before you pour your mix in because that will help keep the mix from falling out. Just a handy little tip if that's something that concerns you. All right so after you have decided what you're going to do for your mix go ahead and we're going to get it out into the pot. Now when I do this especially for a larger pot I do it a little bit at a time because peat moss, which is in almost every mix, is hydrophobic, which means when it's dry, it actually repels water. And so when we pot things up here, we actually go ahead and basically do a step where we pre-moisten the growing mix. So you can see the top layer here is a light brown color. 
And Melanie, do you, uh, Joel would like to know, do you test for pH? Um, I mean, we do here in the greenhouse, but I don't typically do that in my own home containers. And that's honestly because I don't really have the time. Um, <laughs> testing for pH is an excellent idea if you're having, you know, you know, some suspicions that might be something wrong with your plants. Most of these potting mixes are pretty are, are well made and can pretty well buffer your pH to deal with changes over the season. Um, but because it is a potting mix and not a soil, I do recommend that either, if not every year, at least every other year, you dump out your pots and stir it over. Um, and we can touch on that a little bit now too. I was gonna talk about it in watering, but the thing is there's only so many nutrients and so much buffering capacity in this mix. Buffering capacity is, refers to the ability of the mix to deal with changes in pH, so how much uh, acidity there is in your mix. Um, I always, like, so that's why it's so important when you're fertilizing containers, you have to think about how much fertilizer you're using, how frequently you're applying it, because when you water your container so frequently, you wash out the available nutrients much more quickly than you would if you were growing your plants directly in the garden, in regular soil. So I go ahead and you can see I poured a little bit of water on here and now I'm mixing it up. And so the way that I like to explain this to people, especially when we get new people started here in the greenhouse, is you wanna go ahead and you want your mix to be uniformly moist. And when you take it in your hand, you should be able to clump it lightly in your hand and it should hold. So you can see in my one hand, it's holding, it's holding together pretty well. So this is moist enough to use. You don't want it to get it so wet that if you squeeze it, that water starts dripping out, that's way too wet. The other thing I like to say is, think about baking or, or cooking. Basically, you wanna get everything mixed in there really well so it's uniform. Like if you're making chocolate chip cookies, you want all your chocolate chips to be evenly distributed throughout each cookie. So this is a similar thing. You know, make sure your mix is evenly moist. And if you did decide to tackle the task of making your own mix, you know, buying out, going and buying out all the individual components, you need to make sure that you mix it really well. And that's why I suggest kind of going in layers if you have a really big pot, because otherwise you're gonna discover that the bottom, the mix, the bottom of your container did not get mixed in with everything else. All right, so the first plant we're going to plant today is what I feel is a lot of people's favorite garden vegetable, the tomato. Couple things about tomatoes. I already touched on one, tomatoes are heavy feeders. And a lot of tomatoes, especially the heirlooms, get really big, like five, six feet tall, big. So you need to get as big of a pot as you can. Um, I'd actually go bigger than this. I'm using a, a smaller pot today simply because space constraints. Um, so go ahead, get your pot. The other thing you need to think about is if you're gonna plant a big, really big tomato in a pot, you have to have some way to support it. So either by you know, creating your own cage with stakes or going out and buying a pre-made cage from the store. If you have your tomato plant and it's pretty tall, now this is a good sized plant right now, but even with something like this, and I'm not gonna actually do it because this little guy is gonna be part of our sale, so I don't. <laughs> um, I don't want to do it for someone else, but I would go ahead and I would pick up all these leaves up to here, and then I would go ahead and I would actually bury it up to here because tomatoes will send out roots. These nodes, it's just a term for where the leaf is attached to the stem, uh, will send out roots, and you'll actually end up with a stronger tomato plant if you do that. The other thing you can do is, you also can simply lay your tomato plant on the side and bury it up to here, and then it will turn itself with the light and grow straight up from there. So this is a, a black creme, um, but today we're gonna plant this little guy who's called Tidy Treats. And Tidy Treats is actually a hybrid tomato. And this is an interesting one because a lot of times hybrid tomatoes are what they call determinate, which means that the majority of the fruit's gonna ripen all at the same time. Um, tidy Treats, is a semi-determinate plant, which means it's going to give you a big crop when um, you know it first comes in, but then will still give you a good harvest over the rest of the season. 
And heirloom tomatoes, they refer to as being indeterminate because they ripen over the course of the entire growing season. You get pretty uniform production. Of course, that will taper off as you go into fall, but that's normal no matter what. So I simply went in here and I you know, planted my little guy. And I know he looks really tiny now in this pot, but tidy treats can grow to be three, if not five feet tall. So <laughs> once the temperatures start to warm up, he'll get big really quickly. So tomatoes are a warm season vegetable. So your crops like your tomatoes, your peppers, eggplants, oh, and beans, that's always one to remember. They like warm temperatures. Beans are really particular, especially if you direct sow them in the ground. They like the soil temperature to be at least 75 degrees before they germinate. So if any of you have gone ahead and planted any of those warm season crops, um, have them outside already now and wonder why they're not doing well, it's because they're cold. But when things warm up, they should take off. That's why they're happy here in the greenhouse because we have nice warm temperatures. Some things that you could plant right now would be lettuce, you could plant spinach, you could plant peas. Um, but if you plant peas, remember that it's a climbing crop. So anything that has a vine, if you do it in a pot or even if you do it in your garden, you have to make sure that you give it a trellis or some kind of support for the vine to grow up. Uh, you can also grow beets right now or carrots would be another good option as well. If you're going to do carrots, I would suggest getting a dwarf variety if you wanted to try a carrot in a container. And these last couple of years, the horticulture industry has really come out with a lot of new plants. Um, new hybrids that are meant for container gardening. So they're going to be plants that, you know, don't get as tall, stay smaller. They even have some squash now that are bush, more bush type instead of vining. So it's more conducive to growing in a pot. Um, some of the older crops, and obviously here at Mount Vernon, we grow a lot of heirloom plants. While they are beautiful and wonderful and flavorful, most of them are also very big and are simply just not conducive to growing in a pot. All right, so that's our tomato. Does anyone have a question? Melanie, have a question? Ver Veronica would like to know, um, you should hope you cover a little bit about worms and other good critters in planters uh, above veggie gardens. Um, yeah, so worms are obviously great. If you want to encourage worms, I don't know if any of you want to, you can actually go out and get your own kit um, to basically grow your own worms. Um, and the nice thing about that too is the way to actually do composting with it as well. So the worms, you would feed them with your compost scraps and then they make their um, worm castings and that's actually amazing to put in planters, the worm castings. Um, I don't really add worms or anything to my mixes. Um, I just don't. I haven't um, and I've had success without doing it. I do other things to encourage various insects that I want to have around. So I'd say one of the big things to encourage beneficials is having flowers around your plants. So now this is a good topic to touch on. So we get a lot of questions about why does my tomato plant look really good? Like it's green, it's healthy, I got a lot of blossoms on it, but I didn't get any fruit. Can you tell me why? Well, because you need someone to pollinate the tomato flowers or you won't get any fruit. So no pollinators, no fruit. So I recommend if you're gonna do a container garden that's mostly focused on vegetables, go ahead and plant up at least a mixed container of herbs, or it's really great to plant up at least a few pots of flowers to have around to bring those pollinators into your vegetables because if you have something to attract the pollinators and bring them in, then they will find your vegetable flowers and pollinate them so you can get good fruit set as well. Um, you know, I just, in my own gardening, I just do other things to encourage beneficial insects um, that help out with the non-beneficial insects, the detrimental ones. I make a point, I don't spray my plants. I do a lot of hand squishing if necessary. Um, you know, if there's, a, honestly, if there's a few aphids, they're not too bad. Sometimes we'll just leave them alone because you'll see your beneficial insects coming in and they'll take care of the aphid population for you. Oh, and this isn't, here, this is just one of my public service announcements. So if you like to grow parsley, plant extra parsley for the swallows and butterfly caterpillars, because if you have a lot of parsley, you'll most likely get butterfly caterpillars, which I think is a very fun addition to having in your garden. 
And sometimes uh, they actually have flown in here into the greenhouse and lay their lay eggs on our parsley in here. And then, um, no, we just pull the plants aside and let the caterpillars munch away and then go away to you develop their chrysalis and then they fly off. And then the great thing about parsley is because it's a plant that grows from a crown, it will regenerate. Okay, so talked about the tomato. Um, we are gonna move on and talk about figs. Melanie, uh, a couple questions on tomatoes. Sure. Uh, so any suggestions for keeping hornworms away from tomato plants? Oh, the hornworm. I mean, I just pick them off by hand. The one thing that I do say, if you don't want to pick them by hand, if that freaks you out, because I know they're big and green and squishy, um, have you ever noticed on your hornworms, like these little white dots on the back of the hornworm? That means that a wasp has come along and laid its egg on your hornworm, and the, when the wasp babies hatch, they will kill your hornworm for you. So if your hornworm has these like white, I mean like little, they are these tiny white eggs on the back of it, basically stuck on the back of the hornworm, leave it alone, don't kill it, because then the wasp babies will hatch and they will help you out with any of your, if you have any more hornworm problems. Now we need a question uh, from Janet. Uh, mm -hmm. How deep do you, do you have to plant the tomatoes? So, or how deep is should the pot be? Um, well, it's gonna depend on what tomato variety you're trying to grow. So there are several varieties that are suited like patio, patio tomato. Um, you know, this pot's what, at least 12 to 18 inches. So at least 18 inches, um, I'd say probably more like 20 inches, 24 inches is ideal. And if you're growing a tomato that's meant to be grown in a container, a smaller tomato variety, if you wanna grow one of the giant heirloom tomatoes in a container, I mean, you need to get a container that's got like a 30 inch diameter which is probably gonna have like at least a 24 inch depth to it. Um, big tomatoes, you really can't go too big with the container, if that's possible. And then once again, if you're gonna grow a big tomato, you need to be feeding it pretty much weekly. And I would suggest mixing in a slow release fertilizer when you plant it too, so it's getting some constant feed. And then you can top it off with a fertilizer. Oh, and that's a good point. That makes me think of a good point. Sometimes people get really gung-ho to feed their tomatoes because they know that they're heavy feeders. So the first few weeks, you can feed your tomatoes with a fertilizer that uh, is higher in nitrogen. But then once you start to notice some blossoms, you should switch to a blossom-boosting fertilizer because you can feed your tomato too much nitrogen and then get a super healthy, beautiful green tomato plant and not get any flowers. So something to consider. And if you need some help selecting a fertilizer, I suggest going to your local independent garden center and they'll know how to guide you with the products there. Help in selecting that. Yeah. Oh, and if you're gonna get a really big container for your tomatoes, definitely get one of the more like the new plastic or resin ones because you're not gonna wanna lift a giant ceramic container with a, your giant tomato in it. Any other tomato questions today? I don't think so. All right, so figs. Figs are one of the easiest fruits to grow in containers. Um, you can also plant them in the ground as well, but since we're focusing on container gardening and people are really interested in producing their own food, this is an easy one. So our figs, actually, and this is a super young fig. This fig was just started in December from a dormant cutting. So. We go to our lower garden here on the estate and we take, <laughs> we basically cut these branches down to the ground and come in, bring them inside and then cut them into six to eight inch lengths and then we stick our fig cuttings. And we're producing 500 to 600 figs a year. Our figs have become one of our best sellers. And a little plug for our plant sale, they are also part of our general's choice line of plants, which is plants that were grown here during George Washington's time. And then we propagate them from plants here on the estate for sale. So I'm getting ready to plant my fig. I'm gonna go ahead and loosen up the root ball at the bottom here. And then I'm making, basically I'm just making an indentation in my growing medium here. And I, and I did go ahead and I pre-wetted most of my medium 
uh, before we started today just to facilitate things. And then I'm gonna go ahead and put my fig in the center of the pot. And then go ahead and fill it on the sides. And now, Melanie, Donna yeah. would like to know, um, do you recommend a thin layer of gravel on the bottom of the container to aid in dry drainage? I do not. So they used to tell people to do that all the time, um, but now the industry has changed its tune and they suggest skipping that step now. Yeah. The only exception for that is um, sometimes when you're growing succulents, you need to do that, but that's a whole other workshop. So the nice thing about growing figs as in containers is you can control their size. But because you're restricting the size of the root ball, your plant can only grow so big. And Melanie, are these uh, figs that you can eat? These are figs that you can eat. And I can testify that they are very delicious. <laughs> I didn't know how much I liked figs until I came to work in Mount Vernon and got fresh figs out of the lower garden. And Teresa would like to know, uh, how do you keep birds away from eating your figs? So if you just have one plant, um, we don't have that problem here as much because we have so many figs, so there's enough to go around. But if you only have one plant, you can look for places, there's websites or stores, they sell netting that you can put over your plant to help with that. So it'll still let the light in and you know water and everything, but it'll keep the birds from being able to eat your fruit. So not only can you use that for figs, but they also make netting that's big enough. Um, so if you're someone who actually has large fruit trees, you can do that as well. So I would look for their netting designed to cover up fruit trees to help with that. So, Figs in most zones are deciduous, so you put them. You want to put them out for the growing season when it gets warm enough, um, and they can take a fair amount of cold. But you wouldn't want to take the fig out and put it right out into a right outside on a night that's going to get to uh, freezing temperatures. So keep it out for the growing season. You'll get your figs, and then when the first frost hits in the fall, usually a lighter frost. Um, but basically you want to wait until all the leaves fall off your fig and then bring it inside. And what I do is I bring it inside and just put it in my garage for the winter. And you don't want to, you want to keep it dry, but you don't want to dry it out too much. So you do want to check it occasionally and give it a drink of water. Um, and then, yeah, you just keep your fig in your garage. And then when it's time in the spring, usually around now, um, actually, honestly, I have a couple of fig plants about on my deck for a few weeks and they've been doing fine. Um, so bring it outside gradually. So when you bring it outside, don't put it in the direct sun. Put it in a shaded location for a few days, you know, when the temperatures are, say, going to be in the 40s at night uh, before you move it into full sun. Because you figs do want an area, and this is especially if you're in a northern growing zone, but it is applicable here in, growing, in zone 7 as well. Um, figs usually like to have a really nice, hot, sunny spot and some protection from the wind. They're native to the Mediterranean, so... They're used to warm temperatures, soils on a little bit drier side. Oh, and the good news is that also means that they're used to the poorer soils of the Mediterranean. So they're they're about a medium feeder, so you're not going to have to fertilize them like you're going to have to fertilize a tomato. I would just incorporate some slow-release fertilizer um, into the pot, and then you could pretty much let it go from there. And Melanie, Sharon would like to know, uh, what do you do about heavy rain and losing uh, leaves on the fig tree? I mean, I haven't had a problem with that before. Um, if you know the rain is coming and you're concerned about that, then I would move your fig to a sheltered location. Um, if you have an awning that you can put it under, um, or if you don't, then you may need to, you know, just pull it inside for the night. But I can also testify to the fact that my figs have just survived the heavy rainstorm of a couple weeks ago that we had at our house, and they're just fine. So figs are figs are pretty hardy plants, and that also another added bonus don't usually get a lot of pest problems and they're just pretty easy to take care of. So, you know, for someone who's a novice gardener, it's actually a good plant to start with. Yeah. Anything else? Speaking of uh, kind of not novice gardeners and uh -huh. whatnot, uh, the, the, the balcony that uh, doesn't get the best light, um, 
uh, what type of vegetables and herbs would you suggest uh, for the, the, that type of area? Oh, yes, that's a great question. So for an area to be considered full sun, it has to get a minimum of six hours, ideally eight or more. Um, and if you get less than that, then yeah, you're looking at part sun to shade. So if you do get any sun on your balcony, I would suggest um, investing in some plant caddies to put under your containers so you can basically, I mean, this is of course if you have as much time or when you are home, you know, try to move them out into as sunny a location as possible. Um, if that's not feasible, some things that you can grow for the shade, uh, like the lots of different kinds of lettuce or other greens can take part shade, spinach can take some shade, um, and a lot of the herbs can take part shade too. I'm sorry to tell you that most of the vegetables, like your tomatoes, they really, really do need to have more like to minimum eight hours of sun to really get a lot of production. I mean, if you have six hours, definitely give it a try and they may not just, just may not produce as well, but you should still get some fruit. Um, if you get less than six hours of sun, oh, it's so challenging. Um, if you still wanted to grow something, you could actually try if you're really gung-ho, you could actually get a few lights and try setting up to grow some microgreens in your house because that's where you sow the seeds and then the seeds germinate um, and you harvest them right after. So the young leaves from a seed uh, that feed the seed, we call the cotyledons, and microgreens is just eating the germinated cotyledons. So that's something you could do relatively easily in your house if you didn't have a lot of um, sun outside. All right. So we're moving on from the fig and going on to herbs. I love herbs. They're so versatile because not only can you use them fresh for cooking, but a lot of them you can actually dry or some you can even freeze dry to use. And even if you don't like to cook, they're really beautiful. And as I touched on earlier, if you let them go to flower, they're really great for attracting pollinators to your garden. So the first herb I have here that I'm going to put in this mixed planter is chives. And this chives was overwintered in our hoop house. And uh, chives are very vigorous growers. So you can see here, I'm, I know, I looks like I'm being brutal. Trust me, the chives is going to be fine. Going ahead here and getting your pulling off some of these roots that are circling because I don't want them to keep circling in the pot. I want them to grow down towards the bottom of the pot. So for this combination, I'm going to put my chives in the center. And as you can see here, this chives is getting ready to bloom. It has all these blossoms on it. So not only can you eat the chive leaves, but you can eat the blossoms as well too. So if you want to get really fancy and impress your friends and neighbors when we can start having big dinner parties again, you can go ahead and try to make a beautiful garnish. If you wanted to, uh, when the flower is open, you could just separate, you separate out the little blossoms. The chives and fluorescence is made up of a lot of little flowers, so you would want to take all the little flowers apart and basically like sprinkle them. So they basically look like ice cream sprinkles, like that kind of size. Um, don't leave the chives, <laughs> don't leave the chives and fluorescence whole and put that on someone's super salad because they'll probably get a little, it might be a little too much uh, onion flavor for them. Um, but yeah, they're beautiful sprinkled on top of salads or I've uh, been served soups with chive blossoms sprinkled on top of that. A lovely uh, pea soup in the spring, with that beautiful green color with then the light purple chives blossom sprinkled on top. Gorgeous and tasty too. Um, so I went ahead and I put the chives in the middle. Oh, and one other thing that I love about chives. So for the last couple of years, I've had some herb planters on our deck and the herbs in there, there were annuals, they died, of course, uh, when the freezing temperatures hit, but there were chives in the planters. Totally neglected, totally ignored them. I didn't, I didn't even water them. I just left it up to Mother Nature. Um, and every year the, in the spring, the chives come back. And that went on for, mm, that was at least two, if not three years. And the only reason they're gone now is because I actually got around to taking them out of the planters and planting them in my garden. So... Melanie, Jenny would like to know uh, any uh, tips for growing herbs like uh, cilantro. Oh, so the thing about cilantro is that cilantro likes cool weather. So you can usually get, if here in zone seven, we can get two rounds of cilantro in a season. Uh, so right now is great time for growing cilantro. So, you know, plant your cilantro now 
And then you'll notice when the warm weather hits, your, the, the cilantro is going to, we call it bolt, or it's gonna send up a flower stalk and go to seed. And it's not you. you, you know, you're not a bad gardener. It's just what's gonna happen to everyone. It's what happens to me. Um, so go ahead, and if you want to, you can let it go to flower, because once again, those flowers will attract your pollinators. And it is actually pretty easy to collect seed off your cilantro. So if you wanted to, you could actually let it go to seed collect the seeds, um, you need to let the seeds basically turn brown and kind of dry out. And then you could actually go ahead and sprinkle them into another pot or if you do have a garden, um, out in your garden. And then when things cool off in the fall again, you can get another round of cilantro growing. You can also look for, there are some cultivars, uh, the cultivar of cilantro we sell is called Santo and it's one that is, they call a slow bolt. So it's slower to send up the flowering stalks than some other ones. So if you're a real, you know, salsa lover and you, you like a lot of cilantro, I would look for a slow bolt cilantro cultivar because you'll be able to get a longer season out of it compared to a non-slow bolt cultivar. Uh, so I went ahead and I put, this is some Italian oregano I went and put in here. And I'm gonna go ahead and add some basil. The Italian oregano is also a perennial herb, so in most zones, you could go ahead and leave that in your container. For those of you who don't know when I talk about zones, um, I'm talking about growing zones. And if you don't know what growing zone you're into, you can simply Google it. There's so many websites out there to help you figure it out where you can punch in your zip code and then they'll tell you what growing zone you're in. Um, so you can figure out you know, plants that are hardy in your area. Um, so back here I put some, this is some Italian basil right here. And then I'm also gonna put in, this is English thyme. Nope, oh, I need to get a little bit more mix in here. Melanie, Miriam would like to know, mm -hmm. uh, are there any vegetables or herbs that deer won't eat? Oh, the age old deer question, yes. Well, I can tell you that they like parsley. Um, <laughs> they usually leave my sage alone. They ha don't bother my chives. They don't like the usually the oniony taste. Um, they have not eaten my mint, although that's a whole other mint can be a whole other challenge in itself because um, you know if you plant it mint in your yard, it can take over. So I do suggest planting it in your pot. Um, they tend to stay away from lavender and rosemary too. I mean, overall, they usually don't like things that are scented, so they do tend to stay away from herbs more than a lot of other plants. Now that doesn't mean that they won't eat them. Like I said, I know they like parsley, well, so do my bunny rabbits. Um, but for the most part, they really do leave my other herbs alone. You know, <laughs> more than the deer with like any kind of container gardening I do, I have a problem more with squirrels. Um, squirrels are very curious. You know, and you put something new out on your deck or in your yard and they really like to come check it out. And by checking it out, I mean come and dig up your entire planter, uh, dump the mix all over the ground, and then leave you to deal with the mess. <laughs> um, and if you're having a squirrel issue, oh, and actually want a couple more things I want to touch on on the deer issue before we move on to those pesky squirrels, although I will say they can be cute too. Um, so here at Mount Vernon, we definitely have a deer problem in the gardens that are not walled in, and we do spray uh, the plants with liquid fence. The only thing about the herbs though is you wouldn't want to spray it with something like that with a deer repellent because um, you don't want to spray the part of the plant you're going to eat. So Melanie, uh, uh -huh. Paul would like to know sure. uh, how how are you compensating for uh, the tight spacing in the pot? So most of these herbs I'm not too worried about just because I'm gonna keep them in here for a season, like the basil is gonna, um, you know, only last to the end of the season in here. But if you have a pot, and actually if I was doing this at home for the whole season, I probably actually would put this in a bigger pot. Although if you only can manage a pot like this, then you just need to keep everything pinched. So, which means you either need to do a lot of cooking or you could dry some of the herbs or you can start giving away to friends and family. So um, go ahead and Oh, and this is the thing about the basil. So you can either do a really light pinch on the basil where you just basically pinch off the top of it, um, or you could go down here. So when you harvest your basil, never go all the way down here and cut it off because then it's not, this plant's not gonna produce anymore for you. 
you just want to keep basically pinching off these branches at the top. Um, and if you pinch off on here, I don't know if Matt can get close enough to show this, but there's actually tiny sets of leaves right here that if I were to remove this top shoot, they would then, um, the side shoots would then come out. And then that's the base you want to harvest. So to keep it in a pot this size and make that work for you, it's keep harvesting, keep pinching the plants. Um, the parsley, you know, you simply come in here and you go down towards the base of the crown to harvest your parsley. You would go down here and then you can see, or hopefully you can see, that here's where the parsley is regenerating from, from down here in the crown. So you want to keep going on these side shoots. And then for the oregano, it's like the basil. Come in here and you can just pinch off, you know, on the oregano. Now, the oregano is pretty vigorous, so don't be concerned about taking off too much. And then, you know, it's the same thing. At the time, you do the same way as the oregano. But that's really how to control the size of your herbs if you have to use a smaller pot. Um, and then at the end of the season, if you wanted to keep your pot in the next year, the chives, you actually would want to go ahead. Um, I Dig it up and you can divide it. Um, chives are so easy to divide. And then that's also a good way to keep the size under control as well. And because we are using this many plants in a small area, it's time to talk about fertilizing again. So I would mix a slow release fertilizer in here with it. And then I would also do, uh, with the herbs, I wouldn't necessarily do a weekly liquid feed like I would recommend with the tomato, but you know, every few weeks, think about giving them um, a dose of the liquid food as well, just to help because you do have a lot of plants in a small space competing for nutrients. So, and it's up to you then to help your plants out and provide them with the nutrients they need to keep going for the entire growing season. All right, so. Melanie, Deanna would like to know, uh, will one herb take over the entire container? Uh, or do they grow together? Or? It will if it's mint. Or a lemon balm. Lemon balm loves to reseed itself everywhere. Um, the oregano, and in this container, the one I would watch the closest is the oregano. This Italian oregano um, can have a tendency to take over, so it's back to, it's really important to keep up, you know, if you do it like ideally, like a weekly pinching or harvest to use your herbs will help keep it under control and not cause it to outcompete the other herbs in the container. Um, the basil can get pretty good sized as well, but once again, if you just give it the little pinch, you know, just use a little bit at a time. Um, you should be able, you can keep it under control pretty well too. And that also keeps it from going to flower and um, will supposedly keep the taste better if the basil's not in flower. Although honestly, I've used basil in flower before and I haven't been able to really notice a difference, but I'm sure that my palate compared to a culinary genius is not the same, so. Melanie, a lot of questions yes. about fruit, um, mm -hmm. and particularly, uh, you know, how do you, how, what's the best way to grow it, um, and you know, how do you keep deer and other animals away from it? Um, these people want to know about fruit and containers or fruit in the garden in general. Fruit, fruit containers. So fruit and containers, challenging. Um, I mean, so if you wanted to try some things, first of all, you're going to have to make sure that you're buying a fruit that is meant to be grown in a container. Um, and there are a lot of cultivars of fruit out there that you can grow in a container. Um, there's lots of oranges and lemons and limes that are have been um, hybridized to stay small and grow in a container. I know there's even a small type of mango. I've seen small avocado trees. Um, but if you're going to talk about you know things like a raspberry, that's going to be more challenging. One another fruit that is easy to grow in a container though is uh, strawberries. Strawberries are easy to do in a container. The thing you have to remember is um, if you have one strawberry plant, you're just not going to get that many strawberries. So how many strawberries you know do you want to get? I'd recommend then you know getting a container, um, and they have containers that are called strawberry pots, and they have these little holes in the sides all the way up the pot where you can plant the strawberries um, to help you get a bigger harvest. It's going to be the same thing that I was kind of talking about. So if you do a big container like that with a lot of strawberry plants, you need to make sure that, you know, you're keeping them watered and you're keeping them fed to get your strawberry production. Um, and then strawberries will send out little runners. That's how they make more plants. But, you know, if you if you're growing them in a pot, I would pinch off the runners so that way 
the plant focuses its energy on what we call the mother plant and then producing the fruit for you versus putting out new daughter plants. Um, so you don't want it to be sending out daughter plants when in the mother plant can be producing fruit for you. Something else to check out, and we actually had them at last year's plant sale, and I'm sorry to say that we do not have them this year just with everything that's happening. Um, they were really popular, and I actually would have tried one myself if there had been any left, but <laughs> there's actually a line of blueberries, and I do think they've started to include brambles now, which means the blackberries, um, and they may have even gone to a raspberry. So once again, like I said, you are going to have to select a cultivar that's been bred specifically to be grown in a pot. So there are cultivars of blueberries you can grow in a pot, and I'd have to look again, and I'm trying to think, um, okay, I'm promoting a non, promoting a branded product, so you can send me, you know, a, no. Um, I'm pretty sure it's Bushel and Berry is the name of the product line, so if you Google that, um, you should be able to find some fruits that are conducive to being grown in a pot. But overall, like I was saying, don't don't try to grow a regular a fruit that's meant to be grown in an actual garden in a container, um, because more than likely it's not going to go well. And then, you know, I don't want you to end up feeling defeated because gardening can be a lot of trial and error, especially when you're first getting started. I mean, <laughs> I've been gardening pretty much since I could walk. Um, I I come from a family of gardeners. I'm from Wisconsin originally. Um, background, background of dairy farmers and, you know, just growing vegetables is what, what we all did and what my family still does today. So I've been doing this for a long time and I still kill plants. Yes, I'm admitting that live to the public. I still kill plants. Um, you know what happens and sometimes you know why and sometimes you don't, but, you know, please don't beat yourself self up about it, especially if you're just getting started. Um, I feel like you know, it just takes a little bit to get used to the signs the plants are giving you because even they, though they can't talk to you verbally, they do definitely give you nonverbal signs as far as, you know, whether they need water, whether they've had too much water, whether or not they need more food. So, but these are all things that you learn with time. Melanie, uh, our first George Washington question here. Oh. What was his favorite plant grown in Mount Vernon? Ooh, gosh. I am not sure what George's favorite plant is. I believe, or I've been told that Martha's favorite vegetable was the globe artichoke. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm gonna go ahead and step out on a limb there and answer for George and say we're gonna get, go with the fig tree for today since we planted one of George's figs and he does of course talk about his uh, wanting to return home to be under his own vine and fig tree. So we'll say that George liked figs. Um, but in general, George Washington did have a great interest in plants and gardening and was always trying to find ways to be innovative and do things better. And uh, George Washington really believed in the power of good manure, which, you know, see, good fertilizer, it's important. Listen to George. All right, so the last combination I'm going to plant up with you today is a flower combination. And this is one of the flower combinations that's available for purchase, or will be available for purchase online tomorrow. Um, since this is the first time we're having a plant sale where people aren't going to be actually able to come in person and shop, I wanted to create some combinations to help people out because I always feel like when I put a combination together, I want to be able to touch the plants and see them together. So I put together eight combinations. Six of them are for full sun and two of them are for part sun. Um, and to have some fun between myself and some of the other Mount Vernon staff, we gave them some cute names. So, or I am biased to think they're pretty cute names. Uh, <laughs> so this container that I'm going to plant up for you today is inspired by our recently redone chintz room. So this is the chintz room combination. Um, and if you haven't been here to Mount Vernon to see the chintz room, please come and join us when we reopen again. We'd love to have you. So the chintz room... There's a lot of green in the chintz room as well as um, some blues and some pinks and whites. It's a very, very beautiful bedroom. I'd stay there. <laughs> um, so the first plant I'm gonna use is, this is Mystic Spires Blue Salvia. I am planting up this container um, with the intention of it being viewed from all sides. You um, obviously could also, if you wanted to be planted, uh, planted to view from one side only, 
um, that's definitely doable as well. You know, then usually you put, you know, your taller plants the back of one side and then work towards your trailer plants in the front. Um, since I am making this an all around combination, I'm gonna go ahead and put this salvia in here in the center. Salvias are great plants, I really love salvias. And not just the salvias that produce like your, your good old garden sage, such a tried and true herb, which by the way, if you ever see your sage go to flower, the flower on a sage is really be a really beautiful light purple. So we're gonna go ahead and get the salvia here in the center. Get that tucked in. And I do, um, as I did with the fig, I you know I do work up the root balls as I plant up the combinations. These out here. And then to accent the salvia, I'm using, I think this, this is a petunia that's new to us this year, but I really like it. It's shown itself to be really vigorous, and I think the flower is, I love the flower. Love the shade of pink with the white accent in the center. Go ahead, work up the root ball a little bit. That in here. So an important thing to remember if you have petunias is it's really important to pinch your petunias um, that's how you're going to get more blossoms throughout the entire season, and it keeps them from getting so leggy. So, out oh, here, I'll try to just, um, so first of all, ideally, you want to pinch the spent blossoms off your petunia. So this is a spent blossom right here. This is a new bud coming along there. Um, so if you wanted to go ahead and actually pinch this petunia, you know, go ahead here, work back. See these little side shoots that are starting to come out? I would go ahead and I would pinch that right there. You know, and then I would come over here and do a little pinch. So if you just do a tiny pinch, um, you know, basically like you're just giving a little trim, um, you'll keep getting flowers continuously. If you go in there and give your petunia a really severe haircut, you may be without flowers for a few weeks because it's going to take its... Um, some time to grow back again. So that's why I recommend just doing just a light trim, just like going to the hair salon and, you know, getting that bang trim to just freshen things up. Probably Jill would like to know, can you yes. combine perennials and annuals in the same pot? Oh yes, definitely. And uh, Kirsten would like to know, what's the difference between the petunias you chose and the mini bell variety? Oh, a calabrachoa? Um, so this is, you know, a regular size petunia. A calabrachoa is, um, has a smaller flower and is slightly different than a petunia. Um, I mean, they're very similar, but the leaves are going to be smaller. They're a lot thinner and the uh, flower is a lot smaller. See, if, I could, if we could take this mobile, I could take you outside. I actually have... Some calabrachoa that we planted um, outside next to one of the greenhouses last year, and it overwintered by the greenhouse. It got enough heat radiating off the greenhouse and the asphalt that it grew back, and they actually are gorgeous right now. Um, I will say, though, calabrachoa can be a little bit finicky. I tend to notice a lot of issues with calabrachoa as far as, um, oh, they seem to be an aphid magnet sometimes, and sometimes they do get some, a lot of yellowing issues. They can be a little funny about their fertilizer. Um, and back to whoever asked that question about the pH, sometimes um, if your pH gets slightly out of a whack, you can get a really unhappy calabrachoa. So um, I would say if you really like the calabrachoa, go for it because, I mean, I usually get sucked in every other year because there's some new gorgeous calabrachoa cultivar out there and I just can't live without that super cool flower. Um, and some years they do great, and some years, then I swear I'm never growing calabrachoa again until I do it again in a couple years. Um, but I will say they have, now there's a cross out called a pachoa. So they crossed a calabrachoa and a petunia. So it has a smaller flower than a petunia, but a larger flower than a calabrachoa. And uh, what my experience growing them is that they're really vigorous, and I have not had as many problems with them as a calabrachoa. So... That's something to look into uh, if you really like that caliber coa look. And uh, Melanie Claire uh, is possibly interested in one of your combinations, but she wants to know uh, do they come in a large pot like that? So the combinations are not going to come in a pot. They are, you're going to get the plants, and then the idea is for you to take them home and plant them yourselves. 
So therefore, like if you don't have a big pot like this, um, you could take it home and you could break it up, for example, plant it in two smaller pots. Um, you know, or it just allows you to use some of your pots at home. So seven of the combinations contain six plants. And then there's one really large combination that's going to contain eight plants. So the combinations that have the six plants in, I recommend for planting in pots that are about 20 to 24 inches in diameter. And then the eight plant combo, I recommend putting in a container that's 24 up to 30 inches. And Melanie, a question from yes. Melanie. Uh, tell us. Uh, Hi, Melanie. <laughs> tell us when petunias drop seeds. Oh well, usually it's towards the fall or the end of the summer. That well, <laughs> that is if you've kept up with your pinching. Because if you pinch off the dead flowers on your petunias, then they won't go to seed. Um, and that's another reason, uh, in addition to controlling the size, to pinch off the, the spent flowers because then. They don't go to seed, you'll get flowers for a longer period of time. If you do want to let your petunia go to seed at the end of the season, then I have actually had the experience where they have grown, reseeded themselves into other pots of mine or even back into my garden as well. So, but um, since the petunias on the market are hybrids, they may not always be, like you may see the variations in the colors. Um, because it's basically you've crossed and you've had another, you've had another generation. So it's just like, you know, a lot of times you look like your parents, but you don't look exactly like them. You look similar. Melanie, we have a, a question from a historic trades alumni, Justin Filipinowski. Hey Justin, how are you? <laughs> I would like to know, would you ever plant tobacco in a container? Well, I've never tried it. Um, you'd have to, Get a good sized container and then I would suggest staking it because the tobacco plants get really tall and they're heavy feeders so you're going to have to fertilize it a lot. But give it, a, give it a try and let me know how it turns out. If you don't want to plant the historic tobacco like we have here at Mount Vernon though, there are actually several, um, they call them Nicotiana varieties, like an ornamental um, that you could plant. That would be much easier to plant in a container. They stay much shorter. Um, so the last plant I just put in is Kirigami ornamental oregano, which I think is a pretty cool plant. Um, so I love the foliage color. It's got this like beautiful green with like a hint of chartreuse and blue in it and will trail over to the side of the container and then gets these bracts on it for the inflorescence or another term for the flower um, that have a pink tinge to them. And then as I was talking about some other questions, I also put in, um, a euphorbia here. This is a new euphorbia we're trying this year. It's called Star Blast Snow Drift. Very fancy name. Um, but I have to say, so far I'm loving it. It has flowers already. It seems to have this really lovely compact habit. And then some of them even have a slight red accent on some of the leaves, which I think is really pretty. Um, and then after I put the petunia in, I put this cute little ageratum in. This is ageratum bumble blue, which I should actually slide over here a little bit to because these petunias, this is a spreading petunia, so it will fill out the pot very easily. So this cute little ageratum, I love the ageratum. I think they have these adorable little button-like flowers, and I love the shade of purple. Although if you would see my home garden, you pretty much would know that I love purple. So I have a lot of purple flowers. So Melanie, a uh, yes. question from Adonis. Uh, she has the Coxones uh, Celolia flower seeds from Mount Vernon, yes. uh, will these grow in a container? And there's also been questions about how do you grow from seed? Oh, okay. Um, you can try growing the celosia in a container. My first recommendation would be to sow it in a garden, um, simply because the celosia that's selected from here, the plants in Mount Vernon, gets really tall. Um, so if you do do it in a container, you might have to give it some kind of support, like run a stake down the side of it to kind of keep it upright. Um, but if you got a big container, you could definitely give it a try. Um, and if you get to the celosia to grow successfully, celosia is a very prolific seeder, so you will have lots of celosia seeds for the future. The future. Um, 
Oh, so seed starting. Well, honestly, we could do a whole workshop on seed starting. Um, <laughs> really, we could. Uh, so if you guys want to hear more, um, you know, send ideas our way. I would be more than happy to do a workshop focused on how to start different seeds. If that's what you'd like to see. Um, some general rules for seed starting. So go ahead and sow the seeds. Um, you know, packages for most seeds will give you instructions as far as like to how deep to plant the seeds. Um, it's also important to note that there's some seeds that need light to germinate, so you should not cover those seeds when you sow them. And then you want to go ahead. Now we sow everything. Let me see what I have here that's close by. Hang on. Okay. All right. So, okay, we'll move the flowers to the side. Okay, so here at Mount Vernon in the greenhouse, and we're doing your larger production numbers that then you're going to need at home. Um, we sow our seeds and do what's called, this is called a plug tray. You can see right here, these are peppers that are going to be going into our gardens later in the season, and they have just started to germinate. You can see the cotyledons emerging here, and a lot of them, the seed is still attached yet. Not quite, not falling off yet. So we try to put a single seed in each cell, and then these did get a, a light coating of vermiculite. And then we brought them in here. So light's really important. Um, a lot of times you need to have high light levels to germinate your seeds. Um, there are a few exceptions. Um, and then watering. Oh, we get so many questions about watering, and people are so confused about watering, which I, <laughs> watering can be challenging. And I wish I could give everyone an easy answer that tells you to water your container you know, every three days. But that's just not how it works. It's because it all it depends on what is the weather like outside. Um, you know, has it been sunny? Has it been raining? And the same thing goes for the seeds too. Even here in the greenhouse, in a in a controlled growing area, you know, if we have several cloudy days, um, you know, the seed trays are not going to grow out as quickly, so we don't water them as frequently. So it's really important to watch your moisture levels because you don't want to overwater your seedlings. That's how you will kill them. Um, so you want to keep them moist but not wet. And it's really the same for your containers too. So now when you go ahead and you water your container after you planted it, and this is just in general for watering. So water it until the water starts to drain out of the bottom of the container. So make sure you have a container or with that has drainage holes in it. And I wanted to talk about that when I was selecting containers. So it's good we're talking about it now. If you're going to successfully grow a container garden for your vegetables and your herbs, your flowers, it has to have drainage holes. You cannot grow in a container that does not have drainage holes. The only reason you should be growing in a container that has no drainage holes is because you've decided you want a water garden and you need the water to stay in there and you want to grow your water lilies. Um, or if you just have the cutest container ever that has no drainage holes that you just have to use, plant your plant into a container that has drainage holes and then set it in a cute, you know, in the cute container. And then when you water, you're gonna to have to take it out to water it, let it drain before you put it back in. So we're back to the seeds. So I think one of the big things why people don't have success with starting seeds is that they just don't water correctly. They and they have a tendency to overwater. And overwatering is actually the number one cause of house plant death. And I feel the reason why a lot of plants aren't successful. Um, yes, they need water, but they also need oxygen, and you have to let the the growing medium dry out so that the roots can get oxygen and the plants can grow. Um, so when you're trying to figure out if you should water your container, and then we can talk about a little more seed starting, seed starting things too, um, you want to actually go ahead, stick your fingers in the container, take out my glove. I would normally I would take out my gloves if I was doing that. Um, you want to go ahead, feel how the, the mix feels. It feels like it was moist or dry. I don't know if you can see it on the camera here, but you can also look for visual clues. So this growing medium has some moisture to it. Did you see how it's dark brown? Actually here, I'll try that. So this is growing mix that I took right out of the bag and there's app, there's no moisture in here at all. So I don't know if you can see, this is much lighter brown in color and it's really just kind of starting to fall apart in my hands. And then this is part partially saturated and then let me see if I can find a fully 
we just fertilized our plants yesterday, so some of the herbs are still really saturated here. So, and this is a very moist, growing medium right here, a really dark in color. The other thing, now this is only if your containers aren't super huge. You can also kind of pick them up to feel how heavy they are to make a determination how to water them, because if they're really saturated, they're gonna be really lightweight. If they're, you know, needing water, then when you pick it up, it should be very easy to lift up. Um, so let's see, a couple other things about seed starting. When you start to get some, what we call, we call them true leaves. So like I said, these are the cotyledons that are first coming out and then you'll get another couple sets of leaves. Let me see if I can. All right, so this is another pepper variety that was started a few weeks ago. And you can see how, um, this is the cotyledons way down here with actually the seeds still attached. So that's the stage these peppers are in. And now this pepper has several sets of true leaves. And this is this pepper is more than ready to be transplanted. And it even has, so the roots have started to circle the bottom. So this can be planted then into a larger pot. I hope that helped a little bit for a few seed starting tips without going into or turning this into a whole nother workshop. <laughs> so we got asked before about if I can plant annuals and perennials together. So let me just do a quick swap here. So if Matt can turn the camera, I will show you. So this container on the floor that he's gonna show you is a container that I planted last fall. Um, it has a cucra in it, which is a perennial. It has a sedum in it, which is another type of perennial. Actually, there's two types of sedum, perennial sedums in there. Uh, there's a grass, an ornamental grass in there, an ornamental kale that has gone to flower. That's what has the yellow flowers on it. And then it also has a pansy in there. And as you can see, most of the plants, uh, the perennials, they overwinter, well, actually all the perennials overwinter themselves. It just depends on what stage they're in because some perennials can tolerate more cold and they grew faster. And the grass, which needs warm weather, is just starting to poke out. So, all right. That container and this container, several hours ago, they looked exactly the same. So this is a way to show you how you can quickly swap out a container. So I kept the heucara, and then I have a sedum here and a sedum here that I used in my container last fall, which are growing already and they look great. I simply ripped out the ornamental kale, the pansies, um, and I took out the grass uh, just because the grass isn't growing that much yet. And then I, I went out to our hoop houses to see what we had that looked good and I grabbed, so this is a guacamole hosta. And then um, these, this is a Nora Barlow columbine. So, Within 30 minutes, I had an entirely new container design using perennials. And people have really gotten creative the last few years, especially with containers. So, I mean, I feel like there's just a lot of options as far as, yes, you can buy perennials and annuals. Yes, you can do a container planting of entirely perennials. I mean, there really is no limit these days to what you can do as long as you know how to manage your moisture in your container know how to manage your fertilization, and you know, have selected the proper container for your plants, and also you really need to select the proper plant too, as we kind of touched on before. Especially when you want to be growing the vegetables and the fruits in a container, you really have to make sure that you're selecting the appropriate plant to go in that container um, to help you be successful. Yeah. So, Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm thrilled that we had so many questions and we have so many people who are interested in gardening. Once again, please donate the, if you're able to. And if you have any suggestions for future workshops, we'd love to hear them. Happy gardening, everybody, and make sure to check out the website tomorrow morning 
to see what plants you can purchase. Thanks so much. Bye.